I did not really know anything about the nation after the war. All I knew was what I had learned in school and what I had seen in movies like Platoon and Full Metal Jacket and video games like Battlefield Vietnam and Conflict Vietnam. Nothing more than a war-ravaged country caused by seemingly evil communist enemies. It wasn't until I visited Southeast Asia that I got the real picture. This is the story of that trip. Today, many don't know much about the region of Southeast Asia, specifically Vietnam. All they really know about is the war, but actually the country has changed drastically since then. Back in the 80s, the country passed a number of reform policies to restructure the nation. But in order to understand why then, one has to look at its history. In short, Indochina, or the countries of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, were colonized by the French in the 1880s. They held on to this region until 1940 when France surrendered to the Nazis. Japan took advantage of this and occupied it until 1945. During that five-year span, freedom fighters called the Viet Minh under the command of Ho Chi Minh fought against the Japanese. After World War II, France tried to take back Vietnam and got into another war with the Viet Minh until 1954 when they surrendered. The nation was then divided in two and between 1954 and the early 60s, essentially a civil war was fought. In the mid-60s, the U.S. became involved to try and stop the spread of communism. They would fight until 1973. In 1975, the war officially ended when North Vietnam invaded South Vietnam and united it under one communist nation. For the next 10 years, the country saw typical communist initiatives until 1986 when the Doi Moi movement made the country more capitalist. Eventually, the nation was open to the world for trade and tourism. In February of 2007, I was invited to go on a trip to Southeast Asia by my mom and her boyfriend, Keith, a returning Vietnam War vet who served two tours as a combat engineer. After an extremely long plane ride and two stopovers, we arrived late into Ho Chi Minh City, formerly known as Saigon, located in the south. We all later awoke to the sounds of fireworks and engines. It was Tet, the Lunar New Year. As I looked out and saw this spectacle, I thought about the fact that 39 years prior, the North Vietnamese Army, or NVA, along with the Viet Cong and VC, launched a massive attack which essentially turned the tide of the war. Keith mentioned how he found it funny to be welcomed by the sound of fireworks, which sounded a lot like artillery. <laughs> Next day, we traveled to a small region outside of Ho Chi Minh City called Ku Chi. During the war, it was used by the VC as a staging point to attack the city. Now it is a tourist destination. Along the way, we passed rubber trees, which was a huge resource for the French during Vietnam's colonial period. Ku Chi is famous because of its vast tunnel networks, but now that it is a tourist destination, it has added an entire section for booby traps used by the VC against U.S. troops during the war. Our tour began with our guide showing all the various traps and demonstrating how they worked in great detail. And she will say that roll is trap and this little step. Well, one into That's true when you step the short step to make the foot okay, into the second Let's try to attack. Okay, come here, come here. Five step and uh white or trick the white in the trap. When you attack now or kick off from road traps, we now attack you like this. And when after we saw how some of the VC fighters lived above ground. Eventually we were led to a shooting range where tourists could shoot weapons left over from the war. Keith shot an M60, a gun he had used previously, while I shot an AK-47. Needless to say, the guns had seen better days. Jesus. At the end of the tour, we were offered to venture into the tunnels. I decided to go. It was small, cramped, dark, and moist. It's hard to believe how anyone could live down there for months at a time. I had a hard time, and I was only down there for a few minutes. We then traveled south to the small city of Vinh Long. Back during the war, Keith had been stationed there and had helped construct a bridge. 
After a long while searching, we finally found it. As for his old base, we were not allowed to enter as it had been taken over by the Vietnamese military. Did you get a shot of that military base before I told you to turn it off? The next morning, we took a boating trip around the Mekong Delta. Our first stop was at a fruit farm on Ong Bin Island. This one kind of eating, just to make wine, medicine wine. Yeah? But a good for no eating. <laughs> yeah. Calabash? Calabash. We were invited to meet and eat some fruit with the owner of the farm, who looked a lot like Ho Chi Minh. After, we took a quick ride over to the island's nursery. There we encountered various types of flowers and trees, all in different setups and styles. We then headed to a place that demonstrated how people make rice crispy. Oh, okay, what is, what's the black? River sand. River sand. Oh. black from the heat. Pop, 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 music. <laughs> You never see in your country. <laughs> you can eat it. Yeah. Eventually, we were let off at the Kai Bay floating markets. From there, we then traveled up north to the ancient city of Hue. During our stay there, we saw the Tien Mu Pagoda, a monk monastery, the ancient citadel, and various other buildings and relics left over from the past dynasties, as well as the recent war. I seem to know a bit of the layout of the ancient city because of the fact that one of my video games had a level involved in play. My mom found that very funny. Before moving on to the city of Da Nang, we stopped at an ancient tomb up the Perpum River. The taxi had left us, and the only way back was by scooters. Heading to Da Nang, we took the infamous High Van Pass, which goes over the Annamite Range. Once in Da Nang, we spent our time at the Cha Museum, which features various statues from the Champa Kingdom. We then took another day trip to Marble Mountain, which boasts a large monastery as well as various statues and temples on and inside the mountain. travel to Hoi An. During our stay there, we would see the ancient Hindu ruins located at Mai Sun. In order for us to get there though, we would be driven up by Willie's jeeps left by U.S. forces. We also took a boat ride around Hoi An. as well as visiting China Beach for a little while. If you miss something else, 
Our last stop in Vietnam was the capital city of Hanoi, located in the north. One of the first places we saw was Ho Chi Minh's mausoleum. In it is his preserved body on top of a bed of roses under glass. No cameras are allowed in. Continuing on, we would see various historic sites, including, but not limited to, Ho Chi Minh's home and the National Military Museum. We also attended a traditional Vietnamese water puppet show. try to cross the street. <laughs> Additionally, we traveled to nearby Halong Bay, which was seen in the 1997 James Bond film, Tomorrow Never Dies. While there, we would spend a night on a junk while seeing the bay's famous karsts and visiting the Dien Kung Grotto. When we returned to Hanoi, we visited many more sites, including the infamous Hanoi Hilton, where such American POWs as Jeremiah Denton and John McCain were held and tortured during the war. When we were there, it was practically deserted. With its long corridors and empty rooms, it gave a very eerie feeling. Not to mention its very creepy looking statues. We then traveled to Siem Reap, which contains the world famous Angkor Wat, located in Vietnam's neighboring country of Cambodia. During our first morning there, we all awoke extremely early to see the sunrise at Angkor Wat. I wasn't all too happy about that, but it turned out to be worth it. To many, Angkor Wat is well known because of the fact that it was seen in the first Tomb Raider movie. During our stay there, we would explore the vast amounts of ruins and temples. <laughs> I even got to go up in a hot air balloon. We also visited the nearby landmine museum, which helps raise funds for landmine removal and supports people who were directly affected by them. stop on our journey was in Bangkok, Thailand, where we traversed the city seeing many different sites, 
until eventually we began our long trip back home. In the end, I saw and learned a lot about Southeast Asia. I experienced firsthand what it truly is now. It is a place where the past and present meet. A place where some still have to deal with the past, whether it be to make money, live with the fact that communism took over, like some of Vietnam's southern people, or have to live in caution of unexploded ordnance like the people of rural Cambodia. But it is also a place where people look to the future, where they can see new chances and opportunities. As one tour guide said, we're communism, but rarely we're capitalists. It can, to the few who fought, be a place to return to seek some sort of closure. For others, it can be a new perspective on an old issue. But one of the best ways to sum it up was said by Keith, who stated that when he returned to Vietnam, he had never felt so much more safe, even in a place that had once been so dangerous.